You're listening to episode 6 of the Library Tech Cast. Permalinks. This episode was recorded live on Friday, October 11th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. This podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Listen to other great tech podcasts at www.techpodcasts.com. Welcome to episode 6 of the Library Tech Cast. Today we have a special guest, Shaylin Thomas from uh, Harvard University in Perma CC. We'll uh, get into that with him in a second. Um, first, we're gonna kick off uh, with the news items. Um, uh, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Jeff Sable from Concordia University in Irvine, California, and uh, my co-host, uh, Riley. Yes, hello, uh, my name is Riley Childs. I am in wonderful Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I am the uh, Library manager and I guess student librarian and, and a volunteer IT administrator at a Charlotte United Christian Academy down here. Um, I do a little I do a little bit of everything uh, with library technology, including a lot of um, information technology management and infrastructure management. Um, but yeah, that's enough about me. Um, so Shaylin, uh, what's your deal and how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, it's good to good to be here talking to you guys. Um, I work on Perma.cc, uh, which is a service that's uh, it was designed here at a uh, Harvard Law School library uh, in our mm-hmm. library innovation lab uh, to uh, essentially prevent or mitigate link rot uh, in academic publications. Mm-hmm. Okay then. Well, uh, we are all up finished with introductions, so um, the first thing uh, we wanted to mention today was uh, Open Access Week, and I'm going to throw that over to you, Jeff, for uh, the lowdown on that. So, um, yeah, Open Access Week is coming up. Um, I think it starts uh, the 22nd of October, and it goes for about a week. Um, One thing I saw on Twitter yesterday was when... um, Let me see. Uh, Florida State University Senate, or excuse me, uh, Student Senate had passed a resolution um, confirming or uh, signing on to the statement for uh, the student's right to research. And basically open access is um, public universities or or even private universities hanging on to their research and publishing it in... uh, Digital repository, which we had talked about before. Um, well, my preference is DSpace, but there's, um, you know, Content DM and uh, B Press, different ones that universities can actually hold on to their their research and make it available. Um, and this is basically a response to the high price of journals going up and up and up. Um, I would like to refer people to uh, the Right to Research website. So it's uh, righttoresearch.org. You can see, go there to see how to uh, get involved um, and and sort of, uh, you know, get your school involved and really make a difference in, in bringing down the price of journals and uh, addressing uh, the problem that I think most libraries do face. Yeah, because it's, um, it is... It is a serious problem, and I, you've mentioned this a couple times, Jeff, about how uh, scientists and professors at universities are doing their research, and then the uh, universities have to purchase back the jur- scientific journals at an outrageous price. Um, and and this is one of the things of DSpace as well, is that they're trying to mitigate, um, a lot of uh, schools are doing this to mitigate uh, the issue and allowing their professors to uh, and researchers to publish stuff um, online instead of online and in a free and in a free and open source environment. Right, right. And I think uh, law yeah. schools. Maybe you could talk on this, Shailen, um, that they were sort of forerunners to this. We're putting they're putting their law reviews online, and it's sort of um, taking taking a, a, I guess a leading step in that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a lot of the law reviews, at least here, uh, definitely have online uh, versions. And I think part of that is because uh, the law reviews are, are based in schools and they're, they're run predominantly by students. Um, so they tend to be a little bit 
uh, ahead of the curve and open to those things as opposed to a more institutional journal that's put on by a, a major publisher. Right, right. And all, all those law reviews are, are, are all free, correct? Um, the or do, or do... the uh, paper, uh, the hard copy versions, uh, I believe, are by subscription, but I think you can access uh, a fair amount of the content online for free from a lot of the journals. Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th that's, that's basically the model that, um, like you said, we want to sort of... Um, impact institutional journals that do have um, a reputation and a large subscription subscription base where I mean counseling it really isn't an option if you're if you're doing research in that field mm -hmm. and that and that's really one of the main problems that uh, that why why spend your why spend your time buying stuff that you should already have when you could be expanding your expanding your collection to possibly include other works by people from other researchers um, and definitely expanding uh, in addition to papers just general knowledge stuff uh, that would help you write papers and stuff. right and I mean these, that, yeah. these professors or uh, you know the, the the authors of these articles um, when they do publish in their own institutional repository and it's open to anybody with the internet connection they they do some some people particularly um, I would say in the science fields and some in the humanities they find a huge audience for articles that were published in a little small journal that maybe had a readership of a thousand academics and now their article sort of was taken shown to you know the public at large and it really found an audience which is another nice uh, aspect of this <laughs> Uh, Cause I know personally, I wouldn't read. I wouldn't read it if I have to pay for it. Uh, because, and that's, <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's like I don't have any money to subscribe to these sorts of journals. And I know there are, um, and some of them there are really interesting articles, not only about library sciences, but about like computer sciences and information technology. But you can't get those without paying an out almost. I'm sure it's not outrageous to some, but in my opinion, it's just a little bit pricey for these sorts of things. Um, and being able to read that sort of stuff and just read scholarly articles online is a really important thing. And I think that getting them online was the first step for like all these pay services, but I think the next step really will be making it open and making it uh, um, f uh, free, free access. Riley, do you think that's the the ethos of, of you know your uh, fellow students, you know the new generation coming up? Is is they don't want to pay for information? I mean, it's especially uh, like journal or magazine articles. Um, most definitely, I have heard uh, um, this is uh, that you can kind of draw um, a parallel to. Um, I've heard a ton of people say, "Why would you buy that app? It's ten bucks," and it's like. <laughs> And that can be directly parallel to saying, I don't want to pay for the information that I'm getting. Um, and I think prices are actually going to probably go dramatically down, um, similar to how when iPhone apps came out, um, it was not ridiculous to pay. Um, it was not ridiculous to pay 40 bucks for an application. Um, but I also think, uh, similar to how uh, apps became cheaper. Um, they will eventually, uh, like scholarly articles. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, in my opinion, that they're gonna there are gonna be advertisements, possibly not necessarily for like mainstream products, but for other things, because hmm. if they're cheap, you have, you still have to pay someone to publish them, someone to write them, all that stuff, and pay for research and stuff. And it's and if you're gonna have to you're going to have to subsidize the lower cost articles some way, whether that's through advertisements or some other way. Because I know that it's just simply it would be ridiculous to assume that the that the publishing house or the whoever's publishing it to bear the cost to bear the subsidies that would have to be provided for that. Yeah, I don't I don't know of any academic journals that have advertising of any sort. Um, Shailen, maybe you could you got any uh. I did, no, yeah, I don't. No, not off the top of my head. 
I, yeah, I mean, I, I just think, yeah, I just remember because I mean, even in uh, what I what I'm basically what I'm saying is, you can look at you can look at apps and say there's no relation, um, but you but when apps came out when apps first when apps on phones first came out it was not insane to pay 50 bucks for a decent application now people just go crazy when you charge more than 5 bucks so i mean it's really a really a matter of saying the prices are going to go down for these things and someone's going to have to pay for them so it you might not see them now you might not see them in 5 years but at some point down the road, there's probably going to be some form of advertising, whether it's advertorials of some kind or um, just straight out ads and magazines. Um, but honestly, by that time, it's probably going to be all digital or something uh, similar to how, you know, the Kindle Touches, they have ads if you buy the subsidized version, maybe similar to that. I don't know. Uh, right, right, cause, right. Yeah. Cause, yeah. And I mean, hopefully, you know, um, with with the prep push for open open access and in institutional repositories and the advancement in, in that technology we could sort of you know even even circumvent that completely but only time will tell yeah you want to we want to move on to um perma perma.cc yes a I'm very a, interesting venture how, how did you how did you find out about this uh, riley cuz you brought well, this to my attention well my mom um was listening to uh, a program on NPR. I think it was All Things Considered, and um, she was like, "You should send an email to them and say, do you want to be on on our podcast?" And you know, uh, I was going to do it last week, never did, and then I had you do it, Jeff, because <laughs> I simply don't have time for that. But let's let's let Shaylin give the introduction on that. Uh, yeah, so uh, perma.cc is a is an archiving uh, service that was developed here, uh, but there are actually now we have about 30 library partners uh, spread out around the world uh, that are behind it, uh, and the the impetus for for coming up with uh, perma was uh, one of the professors here, the uh, professor that I uh, work for, Jonathan Zitrin, the one that you. Uh, or your mom heard on NPR, uh, he and a research associate did a study in which they went through uh, a bunch of law review articles and uh, Supreme Court cases. And what they found was that in the law review articles that they looked through, over 70% of the links uh, in the footnotes were broken. Uh, and in the Supreme Court opinions, 50% of the links uh, were broken. And so we here at the Harvard Law School Library, we're sort of scratching our heads thinking, well, okay, so this is clearly a huge problem, uh, especially in academia where citation uh, is so important and being able to, to follow sources is so important. Uh, how can we help? Uh, so what we came up with is a service that uh, enables authors and editors to give us a URL. Uh, we go to that URL save a copy of what's at that URL right now, and we return a link, uh, which we call a permalink, as it were, uh, <laughs> to the author or editor, and that link will enable a reader to see both what's at that URL when the reader clicks on the permalink, and also a, the archived copy of what the author saw when the author was creating the permalink. Uh, thus, if the website goes down or the content changes, uh, there will always be a version that has the information that the author wanted to convey to the reader uh, in the citation. And so basically, the uh, um, so this is similar in a way to archive.org, or because the uh, but this is more of a um, a bit.ly and archive.org meet sort of thing, right? Uh, yeah, that's that's actually a, a, a pretty good way to, to conceptualize it. Uh, we archive.org, the Internet Archive, who runs archive.org, uh, yeah. is actually one of our uh, collaborating partners. Uh, and and the main difference between what we do and what they do is uh, they have a crawler-based archive, uh, and they're trying to archive the entire internet uh, or. Mm -hmm. 
as much as they can. Uh, whereas we are more concerned with this particular problem of academic citation, and that's our service has sort of an author-reader relationship built in, where you know we're designed to show the reader exactly what the author wanted them to see. Uh, so we're not trying to archive the entire internet. Uh, we're just trying to prevent uh, link rot in academic citations so that people can continue to follow sources as they read. So can you explain the workflow of like what, what someone using this would do exactly? Oh, it's, uh, it's actually really uh, easy. You just uh, go to, to perma.cc, uh, log in. Uh, it, there's a box where you can throw in a URL, uh, hit the button, and it spits back a permalink. And then you can copy and paste that permalink and put it into your citation. Nice. Uh, it, it's very, uh, very easy. And then um, the way we have it set up, so as we're, we're rolling it out, we have a, a vesting process set up that, is ena that enables us to uh, prevent abuse and also uh, makes... There's a process by which a journal... Uh, can vest links, and uh, what I mean by that is uh, anyone can create a permalink, mm -hmm. but only once it's vested by a journal or a blog or some sort of publication uh, does perma promise to keep it forever. So basically, um, it might if it's never vested, is there a chance that it might go away at some point? So the, so the way that we deal with unvested links uh, is it, at the end of, it, it lasts for two years uh, at least. Uh, at okay. the end of two years, the author or whoever created the link would get an email saying, hey, uh, your permalinks are still unvested uh, and the two-year period is, is almost up. Would you like to renew these links? And they can have the option of renewing them uh, for another two years. So it's not... So authors don't need to worry that all of a sudden the links that they made are going to vanish. Okay. Um, but it is it makes it so that there needs to be some indication from the author that they still care about these links uh, for us to to promise to keep them indefinitely. So, okay. um, Shailen, like you in the beginning, you cited um, statistics from specifically the the subject of the law of link rot. Has there, and I know most of the founding par partners are um, law schools, but I mean, I would imagine that, I, you know, I haven't done any studies or anything, but this would be a problem in, in the sciences and, and even to some extent in the humanities. Has there been any interest from other, insti in other I guess I would say, like departments in, in perma.cc? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we've, or, or I guess journals? Uh, absolutely. We've... Um... We actually have a, a law firm using it, and so that's sort of even outside of, of academia. But we're uh, definitely, so we, right now, uh, in its beta form, we're sort of just rolling it out to, um, well, we, we, anyone can, can make a permalink. They can request beta access, and we give it to them. Uh, in terms of vesting, we're, we're just rolling out to law, law reviews right now, but that's not because we see this as, as something inherent to law, it's just because we're at a law school and, and those are the journals that we happen to have uh, around us. Definitely we see this expanding beyond specifically legal citation uh, and hopefully uh, evolving to encompass lots of academic disciplines. I know we've had discussions with people from other universities uh, that have done sort of similar studies and found similar problems with link rot in other academic disciplines. And I think that uh, it would be great. Uh, we on the PERMA team are really excited to collaborate with those people and expand PERMA to cover those disciplines as well. Uh, we don't see it as, as, as a law thing. Uh, it's, it's more of a, a library thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so and then just as far as... Um, oh, yeah, I just have one, um, one last ahead. question. Yeah, so as, as far as um, citation manuals... 
you don't see any problem like with the I know the blue book book is pretty specific and even even to a few years ago um, they they demanded um, you know as opposed to electronic copies they wanted hard print has there been any resistance from law reviews with incorporating this into their citation uh, no uh, we not at all actually we have uh, 12 law reviews at Harvard signed up as well as a number of law reviews at other universities uh, they they're putting permalinks into their citations this fall uh, in their current cool. issues uh, that they're working on right now uh, and we've actually been in in discussion with the schools that run the blue book and we're hoping to get perma included in the blue book in their next iteration uh, because I think they they understand that this is a problem and they see that we're trying to to solve it and so uh, they they've been amenable to to uh, considering that right I mean when you see the statistics I mean you see how large of a problem this really is and I mean it, it seems like perma really does do a, a great job in addressing that and and basically really solving it that's what we're that's what we're trying to do that's the goal <laughs> right on. And uh, any, just, any last questions, Riley? Comments? Um, I just really had a quick, more of a, I guess, operational uh, two questions. A, uh, where can people go to learn more about PERMA and uh, request beta access? Um, yeah, so if they just go to PERMA.cc, uh, there's a button right on the home page that says request beta access. Uh, if you click that, your name gets added to a list and then uh, as we're processing accounts, your account will be made. Uh, there's also an about page in FAQ. You can learn all about the, the service, what it does. You can also email info at perma.cc, um, which goes to me. So uh, I can answer any questions that you have. <laughs> so, so if a journal was interested in incorporating this, they would just email info at um, perma.cc? Yeah, that's that's correct. Any any journals or libraries that are interested in, in collaborating using the service uh, should definitely email uh, info at perma.cc. And one last question. So you said at the end of two years, um, links expire. Uh, how have you all been around? Uh, I didn't notice anything about that on the website. How long has perma.cc been around or Harvard Law School? Yeah. Oh, perma.cc. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Per Harvard's been around for a while. Um, I'm talking about perma.cc. Uh, well, perma.cc is a relatively new project. Um, where we I, we started in the spring, uh, and so I mean this is why we're still in beta. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So this is uh, it is a brand new project, uh, but it does but it, have it, it, it does have thirty. Uh, libraries behind it that are really invested in solving this problem uh, and really uh, dedicated to the, the mission of the, the service. Because my question was, um, have you tested uh, when, uh, after two years, have you tested the email system to get rid of the links? <laughs> I'm just thinking, because I'm a, I'm a web application developer, so that's just one of my questions to you. Uh, have you tested that sort of thing? <laughs> Uh, oh, we, yeah. we we're building that into the the system okay. right now. No oh. one we we haven't tested it in a practical sense. In oh, that okay. no one's permalinks have been have been around for two years. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was just my question. <laughs> have you tested that sort of system? Uh, yeah, but um. So, so so one last question for you, Shailen, before we let you go here. So where would you like to see Perma say in ten years, or where do you see it in ten years? Um. I would love to see see PERMA be, now this is sort of self-serving, but part of the norm for, for citation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If we can get tons of libraries and other institutions behind it, uh, we're hoping to eventually set up a distributed network of mirrors so that even if the servers at one school go down, the content will still be available at the mirrors at other schools. Uh, so, but but... Not, not even schools, like public libraries, uh, you know, publishers like Nature, Science. I think uh, we're definitely aiming to be over-inclusive. Uh, so that's what I would love to see in 10 years, 
uh, PERMA have a bunch of, of partners and collaborators behind it uh, that are all invested in solving this problem. Okay. Oh, thank you. Th thank you, Shailen. So you can find out more about PERMA.cc at PERMA.cc. Um, and yeah, so thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we are we're at the end, I guess. So yeah, yeah. yeah thank you, are. Shailen. It really, uh, yeah, really, uh, yeah. yeah, informative yeah. and. Uh, thank you, guys. It's been it's been a pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll sign off. All well, right, Jeff yeah. Sable. Yeah, I'm Jeff Sable, and uh, Riley, take us out. Uh, you just watched the Library TechCast. Um, you can find us on Twitter. We are at Library TechCast. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. We're facebook.com forward slash Library TechCast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Library TechCast. And just want to remind everyone, you can find us on Stitcher Radio and that we are a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. Um, so I hope everybody has a great week. Uh, Shailen, just go ahead and say goodbye. Bye. Thanks for having me. It's been a it's been a pleasure. Bye bye. You just listened to an episode of the Library Techcast. Join us next week on Friday, October eighteenth, at six thirty p.m. Eastern Time, when we will be discussing libguides and other library CMSs. You can now find us on Stitcher Radio. You can download the app on Google Play or the iOS App Store. You can now follow us on Twitter. We're at Library TechCast. You can also like us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Library TechCast. Audio listeners can now watch episode segments on youtube.com forward slash Library TechCast. Have a great week. We would like to give Michael Schofield a special shout out for his assistance in the initial planning stages of the Library TechCast. The views held by the hosts of the Library TechCast are their own and not representative of any organizations they may be associated with. <laughs>